All right, let's go ahead and find our seats again. If you're finishing up getting a drink or a snack, totally okay. It doesn't bother me, but I'm going to go ahead because, again, I want to, uh, I know everyone's going to be anxious for lunch, and uh, we have a lot to cover in this next 45 minutes. Um, and I'm going to go fast. So, again, please bear with me, but there's just so much content, and the idea of trying to get it all together in an hour and 45 minutes was like, you know, I can cut a bunch of stuff out or I can go fast and send you the slides. So we're sending you the slides. But again, keep taking notes of the things that resonate with you. And, and uh, like Michael said, try to be as present as you can for the next 45 minutes because I really feel like we got some good stuff to share with you. So we're going to jump back into now building the essential sales toolkit. Uh, we talked a lot about how to build a sales action plan. We talked about foundational strategies, which are critical to setting the stage for you to be able to do this. Now we're going to talk about how you actually target and go after some of the kinds of business that you're looking for. Um, and we've got to get this moving again. Come on, you can do it. There we go. All right. So I'm going to talk about four toolkit essentials today. There were a few others on that list out there before uh, that you can pursue. But the four I want to talk about today in the time I have are digital advertising, email outreach, sponsorships and trade shows, and sales calls. And we're going to spend more time and less time as we get to the fourth of them because the biggest ones are obviously the first two, as we talked about living in this truly digital uh, ecosystem that we are in today in 2022. So I'm just going to jump right into some statistics to get us thinking about why digital advertising is so critical in this day and age. And again, quick show of hands. How many are doing some form of digital advertising? So most of the hands are, uh, about half the hands are going up. So maybe I can convince the other half out there. 46% of page clicks go to the top three pay-per-click ads. So again, they're not even bothering to look at the organic search results out there uh, if you were able to rank high enough to be on the, or they're going straight to the top three ads that are on the top of a Google search or a Bing search, and that's what people are clicking on. They're not going to the organic search. Four times as many people are likely to click on a page search advertisement on Google than any other search engine. So again, on Google itself, paid ads have become the way of the world. That's just what people, at this point, there's a trust that people have established that when I get served an ad, it must be something that's relevant to me, so I'll go ahead and click through on it. 52% um, of pay-per-click ads clicks come from mobile users. Again, as we talked about, are you res responsive to multiple devices? 52% of those clicks are coming from mobile. So if you're sending people through off of your paid advertising and you're not in the right platform, uh, you've got a problem. Video advertisements can increase conversions by 86%. And Paul uh, from Baker's Man is going to do a session today, tom tomorrow, uh, about media-rich content and video. Uh, and this is exactly why, because in this day and age, uh, we get ads, but we get video ads, and those video ads are much more interesting to us as human beings uh, than just the static ads out there. And 74% of people are using social media when making purchasing decisions, which to me, I was surprised when I saw that statistic. It's a 2021 statistic. Uh, maybe we're all still a little bit stuck at home, but, but it's still really prevalent out there that social media is a place that people are looking at when they're thinking about making some kind of a purchase decision. And all of this is to say, if you're not in the digital advertising marketplace, you should be, because it's the way that people are looking for stuff. Just like you, if you're going to go buy a sweater, you're going out, you're doing a search, you may be clicking on some of those paid ads, you may be watching a video, you, whatever it is, the same things that work for you work for your primary customer, planners and individuals that are planning meetings and events. So let's talk then about the different terminology that we're going to get into really quickly here as we go through the rest of the digital advertising piece. The first is impressions. So impressions is just when someone sees your paid ad, whatever it is, and we're going to talk about multiple types. Any person that happens to have it served up on their web page or their phone or wherever it is, one impression. And depending on the size of your budget and the size of the scope you're going for, you could have thousands or tens of thousands, or even when I was running Arizona Online, we were looking for millions of impressions 
uh, with the ads that we were putting out there because it took millions of views to get enough people to click through, which is the next term. And that's where we talked about someone clicks on a link or clicks on a learn more button or whatever it is to follow up on that. It took millions for us to get the number of people to click through uh, to then ultimately hopefully yield out for applications down the road. Your click through rate then is simply the number of times people click through versus the number of impressions. If you had 1,000 impressions, 50 people click through, then your click through rate is 5%. Okay, very easy to calculate. Your cost per click is the number of clicks that you got and the total cost of your campaign. So if you spent $1,000 and you got 1,000 clicks, then your cost per click was $1 per click, which would actually be a really good rate. Uh, different segments have very differing rates, and I'm going to show you some stats in a little bit. Um, but uh, obviously, the lower your cost per click, the better it is for you, because that's less budget that you had to spend to attract an audience. Your yield is the number of actions that are taken after that click versus the total number of click-throughs. So again, once someone has clicked through, your yield is, did they submit the application, like in my world, or did they fill out an RFI, or did they uh, send you an email, or whatever it is. So again, these are all parts of calculating your success in the digital advertising world. And then finally, conversions. Conversions then would be the number of sales based on the total number of click-throughs. So of all the people that click through, how many ultimately piece, uh, booked a piece of business at your venue? All right, so I'm gonna throw those words around as we go through the rest of it. I just wanted to level set. That's what I mean when I'm talking about these things. Now, let's talk about click-through rate. So here are some standard click-through rates that you might be used to uh, seeing um, depending on the kinds of advertising that you're doing. So paid search advertising is at the top of the list. The average click-through rate, this is not just for travel hospitality, this is all industries combined, is 2.63%. Again, if you're putting out 100, that means you're getting 2.63 people, so three people that are clicking through and doing something. That's why we talk about scope, like you've got to be able to do this to a wide audience out there. Uh, video advertising, 1.15. Social media, 1.1. Again, I was surprised it's still so high, but it continues to be consistent. Display advertising is 0.29, and native advertising is 0.27. We're going to talk more about these a little bit later. There is a reason why you would do display advertising instead of paid search, or both. And we'll talk about what the reasons are out there, even though they have very different click-through rates. If we look at cost per click, Come on. There we go. We talk about cost per click. Here are some common cost per clicks, again, across all industries for different types of ad media. So Google ad search is only 67 cents cost per click on average across all industries. That's a pretty good rate. Google ads display is $2.32. So again, the dichotomy here is that display advertising, much lower click through rate, much higher cost per click because you've got to get so much more spend to get the number of people to come through to take actions to have yield to convert them that it goes up. But again, I will talk about why you would do that. Facebook ads, $1.35, Instagram, $3.56, Twitter, $0.38, cents. Uh, LinkedIn ads, $5.26. Now, LinkedIn can be a really good way of doing display ads depending on the kinds of groups that you're looking for, but it is not cheap. It is the most expensive advertising option out there, so if you're going to do it, you want to make sure you're investing and you're really crafting a careful message to do it. Pinterest ads are $1.50. Amazon ads, which is kind of a newer thing, $0.89. Cents. All right, so again, everything's a little bit different uh, depending on the channel that you're using and the kind of advertising that you're doing out there. So let's go through each one and talk about kind of the details of each. So paid search advertising, we all know what this looks like. Here's one I pulled off my website yesterday. Uh, I went in and put wedding at venues in St. Petersburg, and I got served an ad at the top of the page. This one was at the very top of the page out there, and we're all used to seeing these things. And Google, of course, over the years did a great job of making them look like all other search results. Uh, and the only way you know it's an ad is that it says, ad up at the very top. Now again, we're all savvy in this day and age. Ten years ago, nobody realized that there was a difference, but now we do, and yet we still, as the statistics show, gravitate to clicking on one of those first three that come up and get served to us if they're out there, all right? Um, the average click-through rate for the travel and hospitality industry in 2021 was 2.18%, all right? 
So again, it was not far off from the number that I showed you before. If you're going to be doing paid, adver uh, paid, display paid search advertising, you can expect your click-through rate to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 2%. All right? uh, the average cost per click for travel and hospitality was $1.53. So certainly not at the high end, but not at the low end either, kind of right in the little bit below average on that, and, which is good. Uh, people are especially interested over the last year. This is, a, this is a 2021 statistic. The 2022 statistic actually had the click uh, through rate was at four point something percent. Um, I really think that's an anomaly because as we all know, we were all stuck inside for two years and couldn't travel. And this last year, how many of you went on like a big saved up, waited till 2022 when it was ready trip? I know I did. I know lots of other people did. Paul's waving his hand in the back. A lot of people were all about travel this year. I'm sure that's gonna come back down as we get a little bit of that out of our system out there, all right? But this is a fundamental strategy that you can use to simply run a paid search campaign to either target a specific audience, so maybe you're looking for wedding planners, maybe you're looking for people that are looking for venues that are larger than a thousand people, uh, maybe you are looking for people that are organizing uh, uh, educational trainings. Uh, whatever it is, you can use a, a Google search uh, campaign to go ahead and target those specific individuals. You kind of call out the demographics of who you're looking for and what their buying habits would be, and then you run a message like the one that the wedding group here did put together. Let us host your wedding at Trade Winds Island Resorts, home to beautiful beachfront venues. Discover the beach wedding venue. And you can see the words that I put into my, the keywords that I put into my search, wedding and venues, are all in bold because those are the search terms. And so they've put on their website the search terms that people typically are searching for. And that's the trick to search advertising, right? Is to understand what are the words that people are searching for so that you can put them on your website. So when Google crawls it and says, who is a good, it comes up, the same thing goes for your ad, right? You wanna make sure that that pops up multiple times in your ad language, because that's gonna make you more competitive when people are, because everyone bids on the same keywords. The more you're gonna show up with the right keywords, the higher likelihood you are that you're gonna be served that ad. Now, again, as someone that works at unique venues, I type the word venues constantly in my work. So anytime I type venues in, that pops for me and I get served stuff like this and I get it in my display ads and everything else out there, all right? But this is one where you can, you can pick a limited window, you can run a couple month campaign, three month campaign, and really like hone in on a particular window or calendar period for business, or you can go ahead and run them constantly. Like there are, uh, we have clients that run them 12 months out of the year. They just shift the message from time to time. So they change up the ad depending on cyclically what it is they're, that they're looking for. Uh, who are they trying to attract? Or are they opening up the next version of their calendar cycle or whatever it is? They shift the message based on what it might be. Maybe it's, hey, we're gonna focus on booking holiday parties right now. So we shift the ad to be able to do that. It gets served up, it's in those top three, and 46% of those people out there that are the ones that click in the top three, you're now one of them instead of hoping that you have ranked or even that our unique venues marketplace has ranked in the organic search high enough for them to find you, find your venue, and, uh, and give you the opportunity for the business, okay? So that's paid search advertising, and I know we're all really familiar with it out there. How many people are doing paid search on a regular basis out there? So a few hands going up. How many people have tried it a couple of times at least? A few more hands going up, all right? So this is definitely one strategy based on, you know, once your foundational work is done to start to refill your pipeline, let people know, target specifically the kinds of groups you're looking for. The next one is video advertising. And of course the video is not gonna run here because I wasn't gonna embed it in the PowerPoint, but this was actually a video that was run in clips about State Farm Insurance that was again on my website yesterday. Um, and I grabbed a screenshot of it, saving an average of 24%. Um, but the idea is that I'm more engaged because I'm gonna sit there and watch the video. And again, we're really familiar with these things. I showed you the stat. And I'll just throw one more stat at you. Consumers are 27.4 times more likely to click through online video ads than standard banners and almost 12 times more likely than rich media ads, all right? We are video users. Anyone that has a kid that's on TikTok eight hours a day knows 
that we are video humans at this point in time. So if you can bring this into your advertising, this is critical. And it's not that it has to be crazy high production value either. There's a ton of stuff on TikTok that's not, that goes viral every day. Uh, you obviously want it to be professional or represent yourself well, but it's not like you have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to get a quick 10 second video ad that's gonna be part of what you push out there. Similar strategies to paid search. You're simply now, instead of using a static environment, you are using a video to attract the same kind of audience. And again, you can do these on short window, long windows, different things like that. Social media advertising. Again, we're all really familiar with this. We go through our Facebook feed. I was going through my Facebook feed. It took me uh, approximately 12 seconds. And I was served up an ad for Marriott Bonvoy. Uh, because I had actually been doing some uh, bookings of some hotels for uh, the next couple months for my trips. And so I get served hotel advertising all the time. Because again, we all know that the retargeting that occurs when you are on a website and you are browsing for something, then you get served up the advertising that might relate to what it was you were looking for in the first place. So again, this is a strategy that you can employ for yourself is to say, okay, what are the sites that meeting planners go to and look at. Um, and there's all sorts of different places that you can come up with out there that they, so they're gonna go to third party marketplaces. So if you're putting together a social media campaign and you're listing websites of where the people you're targeting visit, you'd put unique venues in there. You'd put wedding wire or the not. You'd put event tech, you put some of those in there. It might also be that they're going to, um, uh, EIC's website, right? Meeting planners are going, especially CMPs and things. So you can kind of give Facebook or any of the social media channels kind of the inside edge on where are the people that I'm looking for going on a regular basis. And when they go there, then when they come to their social media feed, go ahead and serve them up my ad so they also know that my venue is a great place for them to hold their next meeting and event. All right, that's the game with social media advertising and all of them will do it. Um, I will tell you, I think in this day and age that um, for venues, Facebook advertising still works. Uh, it really does. People do report some good success with people coming through and getting click throughs and getting some actual in, uh, information and conversions out of it. Um, we're seeing good success with Pinterest, maybe not as much from the advertising standpoint, but at least from the fact that Pinterest is kind of definitely custom made for a meeting planning environment, right? You can create a board of um, uh, 50 great centerpieces. Like you could have your team put this together, create a board for that, pin your website at the top, you know, contact us or book today. So, so people really like that concept of being able to look at things that are relevant to the kinds of activities that they're doing on a regular basis. Um, here's some common click-through rates specifically for the different platforms. So you can see here, you've definitely got to push to a wide audience. You need hundreds or thousands of impressions to be able to get a handful, a good you know, couple dozen people that might click through and engage and want to learn more. Uh, Facebook's the highest, Twitter's second, YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, and Reddit, all right? Now the good news with social media advertising, you don't actually really have to spend a ton in order to make it happen. With paid search, you don't really have to with paid search either, depending on how wide of a net you wanna go or how large you want your geography to go. So sometimes you'll do it locally, sometimes you'll be pulling in from major cities all around you, sometimes you might do it nationally. Those can get pretty expensive to run a six month or a 12 month campaign. Um, here, you could take $150 and you could actually generate several thousand impressions with a Facebook campaign, uh, which is what you're gonna have to do because at less than 1%, you're gonna need several thousand impressions to be able to do it. But it's the kind of thing where you, you, you set aside, okay, like sometimes when we do one, we'll do maybe uh, $200 or $250, and Facebook will measure that. I mean, if you've never done Facebook ads, you can kind of set up how much you spend per day and how much you spend per impression and all the different things that go into it, and it serves these things up and it gives you reporting statistics as to how many were out there, how many people clicked on it, and all those kinds of things, and you can adjust your campaign as you can go. You can dial back the funds, you can add more funds, you can shift the message or the demographics, based on what you're seeing out there. There are easy ways to try some stuff and see what happens, kind of learn as you grow 
into doing social media advertising out there. But they, they work off of the let's spread it like peanut butter as much as possible. So anybody that fits the profile is going to get served your ad in the middle. And we see this all the time, right? Those of us that are Facebook users, um, we get this stuff like every third or fourth post these days almost is something that's being served to us instead of something that's in our network that we want, that we want to see in the first place. We've just all gotten used to it out there. The next one is display advertising. So this is display advertising, and we're really used to this depending on the websites that we frequent. So instead of me searching for um, you know, uh, great resort destinations in a Google search bar, I'm instead going to TripAdvisor, and I'm reading about uh, great places, uh, great resorts, and I'm served up a banner ad from Discover Lake Tahoe, which I'm assuming is probably their CVB DMO organization. So the, the difference here, and we talk about the difference between search ad and display ad, is search ad is that you are trying to connect with people that are specifically looking, using keywords and search terms, for what you have to offer as a venue. With display ads, you're trying to get noticed in a different platform by people that have an interest in that may also be searching, but they're not doing it by going to the Google search bar. They're doing it through various websites and things like that. For Arizona Online back in the day, we would have display ads served on the places that 18 to 24 year olds were going uh, because that was kind of our, you know, our primary demographic market was to look for people that weren't looking for traditional experience. And so I used to remember like I would go to uh, MovieWeb uh, if any of you knows MovieWeb, they do movie reviews and different things about the entertainment industry. I used to love the juxtaposition I would get sometimes because I'd have like, I remember my favorite one was a picture of the Suicide Squad, the original one with Will Smith and um, that one. And they were all in their gear and stuff. And right below it was my banner ad for uh, Arizona Online. I remember I took a snapshot of it and shared it with the team and thought maybe we need to adjust our marketing a little bit. But it's stuff like that where, right, we were, we were looking for people of a certain demographic. Those were the websites they were going to. And instead of them saying, because they probably weren't at that moment saying, where can I get an online degree? But when they were on that page and they saw it, or when they saw it for the 16th or 23rd or 50th time in a four-day period, because we're serving it to all the places that they're going, they finally said, you know, I think it really is time for me to get my degree. And I click on it and I go. And that's why you might think about both strategies. Because sometimes meeting planners are, I'm in the moment, I'm searching, and I'm ready to go. And they're putting in you know, venues in Boston, or wedding you know, ch chapels in this era, whatever it is and that you want to capture them when they're looking at. But sometimes they're not in that cycle, and they're just out doing their normal browsing through the travel and destination and equip, AV equipment or whatever it is that they're into and they're looking at, and you want to pop up and be present in their mind and says, hey, here's a great destination. They might go, gosh, I've never heard of that venue before. I love the picture that was in there. Because again, rich media, Paul will talk about this tomorrow, rich media grabs people's attention and then pulls them in and you may get them out of cycle for when they weren't planning an event, but now you're front of mind and they're gonna click in and learn more or nothing else at least put you on their list for the next time they get back into that cycle. People see the difference between search and display. You can also see though why this is a much more costly proposition because when they're searching for you, that's a hotter prospect than when they're just randomly reading through websites and surfing the net and then they happen to come across something that's out there. But it can be just as effective when done, set up, and targeted correctly. The average click-through rate for display advertising for the hospitality industry was 0.47%. Again, spreading like peanut butter. Uh, it doesn't have to cost a ton to do it, but you're generating thousands, tens of thousands of impressions. The average cost per click, though, is only 44 cents. So there's kind of a trade-off to that, right? You're paying a little bit less, just takes a lot more impressions to make this stuff happen. All right. Next up, native advertising. So I want to talk a little bit about native advertising. This is a form of paid digital advertising that is designed to match the style, format, and theme of the channel that's featuring it. And because it seamlessly blends with the channel's aesthetics, visitors believe it's part of the platform rather than the advertisement. So some people call this sneaky advertising. Um, which it kind of is, but what it really is is it's just simply giving people information, content in the way that they're looking for it. And there's different ways that that happens. So sponsored content would be something like 10 best, I did, what are the 10 best things to do in St. Petersburg? I got a list 
and it started listing for me things to do. Now, I don't know if this is actually sponsored content, but a lot of sites work this way. The people on this list have paid a small amount of money to, this was US, not US News and World Report, US News Today or something, which is an independent site. My guess is these people probably did something to end up on this list. You can do the same thing, right? You could just type in uh, 10 best venues in my area and see what lists come up, and then you can reach out to each of those lists and say, how did you pick who's on the list? Why didn't you pick me and can I get on the list? Did you just not know about me and next time you publish the list, you'll get me in? Or they say, you know, for $500, I will go ahead and you know, put you on the list next. I mean, again, the, but these, isn't this how we shop? Right, this is what we look for. So if you can get in on a sponsored thing, and I just, pull, I just added this one in because um, this is again retargeting, right? I did this, I'm in St. Petersburg, I got served an ad for Arizona football because I was looking up the schedule two days ago. And, uh, and I got reserved an ad. So you can see how this all comes together and works regardless of what's happening in the world out there. Um, product placement is another one. So this is actually the Unique Venues blog. And we did a feature on Boston. And as a part of that, I mean, there are multiple pages. I could only clip so much for the screen. Uh, the first one we featured was the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which is a Unique Venues client. Right? So there are lots of services out there as well that will do product placement. So again, when people are writing travel articles, when they're writing uh, best tips for planning an event, when they're, can you be a featured element within that? It's product placement. It's how do I get in there? And you look for those things, and you reach out, you send to the author, you send to the website, you say, how can I be included in, or what are the ways that you can feature my product? in this or the next time that you do an iteration of that. This is the, the, uh, the native advertising out there, okay? One of the ones I really want to impress upon you is the idea of thought leadership advertising. Um, and the research shows that 58% of decision makers read at least an hour of thought leadership content each week. And we're all kind of doing that, right? We're reading, reading stuff on LinkedIn or reading stuff in different trade journals or whatever it is. And 60% also said that this type of content had directly convinced them to buy a product or service they'd not previously considered. Now, this is that thing where you get that email that says, hey, download our white paper and learn about um, the hottest AV trends in you know, uh, convention centers. And then you do that, but you end up saying to download the white paper, enter your name and email and phone number, and someone might reach out and contact you. But then you're getting a six-page white paper that kind of talks about a subject that's really of interest to you, that is useful. And that's the thing about thought leadership advertising is that it has to be authentic, right? It cannot be a ploy. It has to be real knowledge and content that people are looking for so that they can actually use it and they're willing to trade off for that at least one outreach attempt from you before they say, please take me off that list. Because I used to get these all the time when I was still at the university. And oftentimes, I would put it in, get the diet paper. It would be great. And then they'd reach out to me the first time. I'd say, thank you very much. Please take me off your list. Or I'd hit the unsubscribe button or whatever. But, but not always. Sometimes I'd let them remain. And that's part of the game. So what can you do? You can do blog posts and articles. And you can put thought leadership out there as a way of promoting yourself, your venue, with a click through or highlighting that, or again, providing good information, but also the opportunity for you to connect with someone. Ebooks and white papers, like I just talked about. Original research. So maybe you do a survey with meeting planners. You ask them 10 questions. You get their feedback. You put it together with some nice graphs. You put together a report, and you put it out there where people can download it after they enter in their name and their email address and agree to be contacted one time for follow-up, that sort of thing out there. Or infographics. Another great way is to just kind of take some of all this information, put it together in a one-pager, have it available for download or viewing. And again, at the bottom, there's the link to your website or you know, information about you. All of these things are the way that it works. And especially for a lot of us in here, we, have, we can tap into the knowledge experts in our organization. Right, because again, we're not always the primary mission, we're the secondary or tertiary mission, and your organization has thought leaders that could put together information, and then you can be bundled into the idea of then hopefully grabbing some more information, finding some people that want to book meetings and events there. So these are all different ways digitally to try to grab people and pull them in out there. And again, I'm just going to keep rolling here so that we stay on track. Email is the second one, all right? Email outreach. I'm going to talk about three different ways. E-blast messages, drip campaigns, and auto response. 
So some statistics again for entertainment, uh, engagement rates for the travel, hospitality, and leisure industries. The average open rate, 20%. We showed these before, right? This was in the first hour. I just want to remind people about that. So there's a lot of work that goes into doing this when you're doing email outreach. You've got to have a wide audience that you're blasting it out to. So one way to do that is with e-blast messages. So with e-blast messages, what you are doing is you're basically taking a timely, relevant message that is focused and targeted and creating a sense of urgency around it and sending it to an audience. Um, we do that on a regular basis. Um, perfect example was uh, messages about UVMC. It's time to register for UVMC. That's an email blast. It goes out to all of our clients. You get it. Hopefully it's relevant. You were just thinking to yourself, I got to book this and it's timely and it's got the information that you need and it's urgent. Do this before September 22nd uh, or you're not in the hotel block, right? I mean, again, we live with these things all the time. You're able to do the same thing. You're able to look at your audience and say, what is my target audience? Local, regional, national. Is it timely? So what part of the planning process might they be in? Or for me, is it, what am I trying to do? I've got a hole in um, March that I'm trying to fill. And so I'm going to blast something out to planners and say, right now, you know, all bookings in March of 2023 are 10% off or 15% off. Um, it's focused. So one of the really important things about email blasts that's critical, because we see this sometimes, people try to do too much in one blast. They're like, here's the eight different things I'm trying to accomplish in this message, and it's too much information that gets lost. A good, effective e-blast should be no more than about a page, page and a half of email window space, right? Now, if you've got some rich media in there, it can go a little bit longer, but the text part of it should really be no more than that. If you're sending out an e-blast that's four pages long with all this information, what are you gonna, what's gonna happen? No one's gonna read it, right? Because you don't read those messages when they come in. You go, oh, I'm busy, I'll get to that later. And then you don't get to it later because it gets buried under the next 30 email messages that come into your inbox out there. So it's focused, it's one message, maybe two at most, and then it creates a sense of urgency. It is, you know, what is the special or the discount or the limited time offer, or what is it that a planner or an individual needs to know about why they should take action on this now, click on the call to action in there, and move forward with it. Drip campaigns, I have a follow-up session on later this afternoon, but a drip campaign is essentially structured communication workflow that sends prospective customers a relevant in-time message based on their engagement and movement through the sales process. So the idea here is, uh, and we do this to some extent naturally, like almost every email you send is a drip campaign. I send something to my boss, he engages, then it comes back to me and I now have follow-up message that I have to send back to him. And depending on what I send back to him, there's a different stream that's created. But I don't think about the planning for that when I just send an email to my boss. But when you're doing outreach, you want to think very carefully about the workflow. When you send a message to someone and they engage, what's the first thing you're going to respond back with? Well, how are you going to move them to that next level of engagement between discovery and intent and booking? And what are the kinds of messages? What's the language that you're going to put into there? What are you going to do with the people that don't follow up? So again, a lot of times we will send out a message to 100 people, 12 respond, and that's great. We focus on the 12. What did we do with the 88? Did we give them any kind of follow-up? Did we do a second? Did we change our messaging at all? If you're interested in that, come to my session at 2.15. We're going to dig into how to effectively run a drip campaign to really think ahead of time before you invest the energy in sending out a, a blast or a message to 1,000 people, how you're going to actually sequence it so that everybody gets appropriate follow-up and that you try to move people through the sales fun funnel as quickly and as effectively as possible. Oops, let's come back there. First time it did that. Whoa, there we go, auto response. So I talked about this a little bit this morning from a phone call perspective. The same thing from an email perspective is there's nothing worse than when someone sends an email out, a planner, an individual, they send it, especially if it's a generic box, uh, events at you know, uniquevenues.com or whatever, and then no one follows up or responds to it. And so one of the easiest ways for you to fix that problem as a sales strategy, uh, and to put this in your toolkit, 
is simply to develop auto response mechanisms that immediately go back to someone when they send in a, a, a message. I've seen this done really effectively even at a personal level. Um, there are a couple people in this room, I, I won't necessarily call them out, but uh, if I was, it would be to give them props. Um, I send them a message and they are really busy working an event or they're busy going to trade shows or they're busy doing different things and the auto response I get back says, hey, I am out of the office today. I'm busy doing this, but here's my expected timeline for getting back to you out there. Some people will do that not just when they're gone for a two week vacation, they'll do it almost every day based on what their workflow looks like to make sure that a hot prospect knows, I got your message, I care, and here's when I or someone in my office is going to get back to you. If you're using generic email addresses, that's really easy to do, right? You can set up an auto response every time a message comes into your general info at box, something immediately goes back, says we've received your message, we're working on it, and one of our team members will be back to you within you know, one to two business days or whatever it is. There's a reassurance that planners are looking for that their message hasn't fallen on deaf ears. Uh, and we're all the same way, right? We do the same thing. When we send a message off to someone and we don't hear back from them in a couple days, we're like, did the message go through? Did they get caught in the, the spam filter? Do they not care about my business? Your customers feel the same way. And so there's some very easy steps that you can do. You know, if you've got forms and they submit an RFP or an RFI, does your system generate a message back to them saying, we got this? Maybe it summarizes the information that they put in there and gives them an expected timeline for when they can hear back to someone. So any forms on your site, get a quote. Any general contact pages where they're saying, contact us for information. Any of your out of the office or busy messages, these can all be customized in ways slightly to tell a planner individual you got it, you care, and someone will get back to them on a reasonable basis. I know managing email is one of the hardest things that we all have to do. Uh, I told someone the other day when I retired from the University of Arizona, I had more than 20,000 emails in my inbox. They were all opened and read. And I'm an active filer. Like I probably had 70 or 80,000 messages filed away in archives, but the load was just so extreme that there was no chance of my keeping up. And I know you're all in the same boat. So the trick is, can you employ these strategies? Can you blast out messages when it's right for you to get people engaged and you're ready to do it? Can you go ahead and create some auto response situations to be able to do that? And can you, when you're really doing a push, can you set up a drip campaign? Can you think out the workflow ahead of time and craft those messages up front so you're not trying to do it on the fly every time an email comes in, but you have it ready to go? And, and actually, if you've got a great CRM, it's just all built in the system and the CRM does it all for you. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later this afternoon. Couple more things to talk about for the toolkit. One is sponsorships. Sponsorships are still really important in today's age uh, to be able to kind of show an investment in and a connection to the planners and the individuals that you're trying to serve. Uh, and I know you're bombarded with requests probably all the time, depending on who you are and where you're from. Everybody uh, wants you to throw in $500 here or an in-kind something there or whatever it might be. Um, and um, I went through this as well. You have to kind of curate and measure what are the ones that are really going to have high, R high ROI for you. Um, and so you definitely want to look at the sponsorship opportunities that are going to be your specific audiences. Where are you going to be able to get information in front of planners or individuals who book meetings and events on a regular basis? And then when you do that, if you choose that you're going to invest 500 or 2,500 or whatever it might be in a sponsorship, or you're going to trade out $2,000 in services, whatever it is, what you want to do is, again, make sure that you take the time to think about developing assets that are appropriate to match the audience that you're, you're talking to. So a lot of times people will do a sponsorship and they show up and they get their two minutes in front of the, the group. They haven't really thought through what they're going to say and they didn't bring along a one pager to hand out to say here's more information about us with some contact info. Like if you're going to spend the time and do it, make sure that you do it right and make sure that this information is additive to what they're going to see on your website or anywhere else that you might send them. Because this is your chance really to speak directly to them and then funnel them back to the un their information that you have out there. And obviously from a budgeting standpoint, 
I always believe whenever someone would do it in kind, I was all about that. So I was like, let me host your meeting. For me, that was kind of a waived or a sunk cost. Or I could negotiate down the food side of it. Or let me provide a staff member to work an event. Or whatever it might be, if I could do in kind, look for those opportunities because those are a great way to extend your sponsorship budget farther than where it needs to be. And again, all the groups we talked about before, those professional organizations, they're all looking for you to do this. But you just got to find the ones that are going to yield the highest uh, ROI for you. Trade shows. How many people in here are still going to trade shows of some type? So I'm seeing a lot of hands. How many of those are national trade shows? Okay, so almost all the same group. And for the rest of you, it's regional or local. Um, they still work. They are a high dollar investment in many cases, right? I mean, if you're going to go to RCMA, um, that's going to be a $10,000 or more lift in a lot of cases, especially if you've got to design a new booth and all of the other things that go into it. Um, but they can be really, really effective um, if you're in front of the audience that's right for you. When, when I was at University of Arizona, we did a whole exercise and figured out that our ideal group was a religious conference between 500 and 1,500 people. Well, where am I going to find those people most easily? RCMA. So that's where we went so that we could get in front of that audience specifically. And the return for what we spent each year was absolutely worth it. Um, Local regional things, much more affordable. There's tons of things that go on out there. All you have to do is look around and see where they're at and see what the costs are. Again, MPI does, uh, usually does local and regional or statewide stuff. SHRM does that. Uh, everybody out there does some version of this where you can do it at a lower cost. Um, what you want to do is if you're going to, again, make the investment in it, you want to make sure that, that, uh, that your display materials, everything that you put together, they match your brand, voice, and tone. Right? What you don't want to do is like kind of half put something together and bring it in. You want to look professional. It, want to, it needs to represent you, who you are. It needs to speak to your audience in the way that you would speak to them in person or the way that they'd see it on your website or things like that. You need to identify strategic giveaways that, uh, that are things that people actually want and need. Um, there are still people that walk around the trade show with the bag and put every little tchotchke into it. Um, but really what people are looking for and, and what's memorable is something that they can use and take away. The two biggest um, that I've seen most recently that I've gotten the biggest feedback on, um, one, uh, disposable straws. Or not disposable straws, the uh, reusable straws. So like the bamboo straws, um, in a nice box with the brush cleaner and all that kind of stuff. Uh, huge hit at a couple of the, the things that I've been at recently. Again, planners continue to talk about a sustainable message. They want to know that you're being sustainable. They want to know what's happening with the leftover food. They want to you know, minimize waste and things like that. Uh, so that's a big one. The other one continues to be like the portfolios, where it's got like your brand on the front and it's got 50 pages or 100 pages, or I see a lot of people with those planners on their table. Like if you can give them one of those, like I actually, um, it's sad, but it, well, it's not sad. It's just that I'm using one from uh, University of Kansas right now because I ran out of Unique Venues ones. Um, and so the next one I had in my drawer was uh, University of Kansas. So I'm walking around right now, free advertising for the University of Kansas every time I take my portfolio out. So those are just a couple ways to think about, give somebody something that they're going to use and need so you stay top of mind. Um, staff the booth with people that are outgoing. Staffing a trade show booth is not for everyone. Uh, if you're a high introvert, I get it. I can relate. I am one too. I've learned to flex over the years. Uh, but if this is not you, don't do it. Uh, find the right person that can engage and talk to people and draw them in. And then follow up immediately and aggressively. Um, they went to a trade show, they stopped by your booth, if they really did engage, don't let that sit for a week because you're tired because you were on the road for four days and you're going to take some time before you do it. Do it immediately, do it aggressively because that's where you get the highest yield uh, from your trade show investment out there. And sales calls, last one. Sales calls, identify the local, regional, and national markets where you can promote and sell your venue. So again, a lot of people just think about doing the digital part of it or the email part of it. It's still really critical sometime to get out there and go visit people. Um, and so if you are in, um, well, I'll use Kansas again because I was just there. You know, We talked about going to Chicago and we talked about going to Dallas and Austin and New Orleans and really fanning out to places that would have 
the kinds of associations, groups, and business, and doing research. Again, these are people that you have a connection with. They've responded to stuff. They're in your CMR. They've been engaged. Now you're going to travel and spend two or three days traveling the city. You've scheduled appointments. You're going to sit down, and you're really going to try to push them into making some sort of a decision to come to your venue. Maybe you bring a contract with you or a quote with you when you go and sit down and see if you can make that happen. Uh, because those relationships, they really pay dividends over time. And again, this is one of those things like if, and this, is, this has to be in your wheelhouse. Like if you are the primary salesperson or if this is your job is to sell this business, you got to become comfortable with getting in a room and pushing people to do it. And if you're not that comfortable, Michael's section, second section today is going to be on, you know, developing those skills personally. Like if you're not comfortable trying to get someone to make that say to, to sign on the dotted line, he's going to have some tips and strategies for you to be able to do that this afternoon. So with all of these things then that we've talked about, you've got all these different ways to build a sales to toolkit. Uh, to have targeted strategies to attract the groups you're looking for. First thing is to develop the budget. We talked about that a little bit the first hour. It's going to be bigger than you're probably spending now, like if you really want to do this effectively. If you've got some, some significant growth goals, that's the way it's got to be. Uh, the old adage, spend money to make money, it's never been more true, certainly in the meetings and events industry. What you put in will generate what puts out, but you've got to put in. So if your boss is like, your budget's 2000 that's what it is, uh, you need to advocate with that person. If you need me to get on the phone and advocate with them, call me. I'll be happy to do it and run through some of this stuff and explain to them why you need some more money to make it happen. You need to identify a mix of strategies that fit within your budget and match the timing of your cycle. So we've gone through all sorts of different things that you can do. You need to plot it against that original grid and say, okay, here's the strategies, here's the timing, and here's when we're going to activate each one of these things and plan for them appropriately. You work with experts to build the assets. That could be people within your organization. It could be people that you hire outside. But again, you make sure that it looks professional. Again, uh, I appreciate all the people that think they're home graphic designers. And that works nice for your kid's birthday party or your friend's whatever. That is not what you want to be doing for your business. Get a real graphic designer, get a real video person, get a real writer to write your content for some of these things. If that's not in your wheelhouse, find the person that is and do it, uh, and then manage the campaign, and then ultimately track those results and adjust as you go. And again, uh, I told you we were going to go fast. We're right at time. Any questions that anyone wants to ask of me? Yes. We've got the microphone coming. Everybody wants to hear you. Thank you. For the limited time offers, based on your experience, what is the um, best time frame to have as urgency on those? So, so I think that normally you want to try to get people, if you're doing a, a discount, I think you are trying to get people to move within about a 30 day cycle, right? I don't think you want to say book in the next three months because what happens, people just put that off and forget about it. So I think you're looking for people to do it in the next 30 days and if you can make that happen, then it's worth it. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't do it. I would look for a different strategy to build awareness, connect them in and move them through the funnel than running a limited time offer. Great question. Any other questions for me? If not, I know everyone is hungry. I appreciate you being present in the moment for the last 45 minutes. I look forward to being present with some of you after we get some food.